All right, I think most of us have shifted back, and surely it's beyond one o'clock now, so we're going to get moving. All right, everybody. Uh, so, uh, on our schedule, this is typically when we have our business meeting. We're not going to do that this year. Um, instead, we've got a wonderful keynote speaker, um, uh, and I'm super excited to see this talk, and maybe if there's a lot of overlap from our other talks, because we've been connecting really today, so we might continue. Uh, uh, but I, we're really excited to welcome Marshall Johnson here, uh, our keynote speaker and the Chief Conservation Officer uh, for National Audubon Society, uh, who spearheaded the development and launch of the Northern Great Plains Grasslands Project uh, during his prior service as Vice President for Audubon Dakotas. Marshall leads the strategic direction for hemisphere-wide conservation work at Audubon to address the unprecedented climate change and biodiversity crises facing birds. Marshall. Thank you. I've got to say, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna steal this. The perpendicular tables to the stage. I've been trying for 14 years uh, to come up with a way to get Lutherans not to sit all the way in the back, and I <laughs> I think this. I think you guys have uh, nailed it. <laughs> uh, it's fun. It's really great to be here with you. Um, great to see old friends and. You know, I've run into folks that uh, worked with me maybe 10 or 12 or 13 years ago uh, at Audubon, and those were the days I was trying to shield from everybody that I grew up in Texas, and clearly I don't try to do that anymore, as Mark Martell pointed out uh, here. But uh, uh, really, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all my fellow bird nerds from the great north. Um, where, where better to find you than here? Uh, it is really uh, more than a, a pleasure, it's an honor th to be with you here, uh, particularly at the University of Minnesota, my alma mater, Sky U Ma. Um, yes, come on, yeah, absolutely. We'll do the fight song at the end. Um, I wanna give a special shout out to Rob Schultz, who's our state director for Audubon, Minnesota. Wave, Rob, you can't miss him, there he is in the back. That's right, good job. Um, fundamentally, when I think about um, MOU, um, I think about an organization, a group of people, a society, if you will, that our state uh, needs, and I can say that I spent half my time in Minnesota, the other half in Fargo, North Dakota, where I've lived for the past 14 years. Um, our state truly needs more of you and what you contribute every day to preserving the song and colors which adorn our skies, our backyards, our grasslands, our fields, lakes, and ponds. Um, I have to admit that when uh, Richard King reached out to me, um, I missed the email. Um, and for probably, I think, Richard, uh, uh, several weeks, and I was in Colombia, in Panama. Um, I often tell folks I have staff in Chile and staff that are working in, along the tree line in the Arctic and about 11 or 12 countries in between. And so we truly go where the birds go and I've been going just about everywhere over the past year as we've developed our strategic plan and uh, I've begun to settle more uh, into my role. And so I had missed Richard's um, invitation until I finally got home after something like 22 out of 30 days uh, on the road and he followed up with a letter to my P.O. box that I never checked. And it was, uh, uh, I happened to check it and I'm so glad I did because this gathering is a big deal. Um, and I am so honored to be here and to have a conversation with you. And, and I really want it to be that. Um, I probably won't talk here uh, as much as I am want to do. I won't talk here for a full hour. I really wanna have a conversation with you. Um, so think about your questions, think about even the nasty ones, I'm okay, I'm, I've got tough skin. Uh, uh, challenge me, let's have a dialogue. Um, uh, Minnesota and its birds um, hold a real special place in my heart. Um, I became a birder, um, a bird conservationist uh, on the shores of ancient gla Glacial Lake Agassiz up north. Um, going to uh, attending the University of Minnesota, Crixton. 
um, in, in the way that many, many young people come to a love for the prairie, um, I did as well uh, in a prairie chicken blind with Dr. Dan Sadarsky, uh, who is uh, a lover of the prairie and, 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 and a guide and facilitator of many a young person's joy and understanding of the prairie. A number of years later, I was actually lucky enough to um, uh, acquire a piece of land uh, adjacent to Shell Lake in Becker County. Um, and it's really a place where I'm renewed uh, as, as much as I can get up there, um, hope, usually every weekend, whether it's ice fishing or, or just um, uh, doing some walleye uh, fishing on the, the open water. Um, and what I will let you in on a little secret, what really warms my heart, which gives me a sense of renewal as a bird conservation conservationist every time I'm up there at the lake uh, is the, the trumpeter swamp. Um, and um, their presence gives me tremendous joy and hope because of what they've been through. Um, and it has been said that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, and I know in this room of bird conservationists, we certainly have more than our fair share of giants who have contributed a great deal to bird conservation in Minnesota and throughout the Northland. Um, I want to give a special shout out to one as I think about my swans, uh, Carol Henderson in the back. <laughs> We're going to talk a lot today about recovering bird populations and um, some of what it takes to do that. And, uh, we have folks in this room like Carol who have done that, and we get to enjoy birds like the swans because of the innovation and the tireless efforts of people like Carol. So I thank you, Carol, for being here um, uh, and being a part of this conversation. Um, I have the great pleasure of serving as the Chief Conservation Officer for the Audubon Society. Um, I often say uh, that 14 years ago, um, unbeknownst to me, I won the lottery. And it wasn't money, it wasn't wealth or fame, it was joining the Audubon Society. It was being a part of a purpose that was bigger than me that would guide my life. Um, I didn't know it then when I joined Audubon as a straight out of college. Uh, three months after graduation, I joined, I saw a, well, I followed a girl uh, named Beth to Fargo, and, but that, that's a, that's a <laughs> uh, but I had a passion for, for bird conservation that I uh, didn't quite know yet. And I thought I'd try out this part-time job with the Audubon Society of all things, and 14 years later, uh, I am still here. I thought it would be a six-month endeavor, and I would convince uh, Beth to join me in New England for law school. I never made it to law school, and Beth's my pastor at church now, so um, it all all's well that it, that uh, ends well. Uh, but bird conservation and the people at Audubon have really guided and enriched my life for the past 14 years. You know, it's it's one of the things that um, being here on a university campus, um, it's one of the things I so hope for young people is to find that passion early. Um, and to allow that passion and the people that share that passion with you to guide and enrich your life as it has mine. I got real lucky. It happened to me three months after college, and um, it's still this work, um, birds, um, our uh, obligation to birds uh, still guides uh, my life. And in my role, particularly this role, I spent 12 years as the regional director for Audubon's work in the Dakotas. And so I, I love that the focus of this conversation is around grasslands and grassland birds. And I want to talk to you about grassland birds and my perspective on how we can recover and restore our grasslands uh, moving forward. Um, but um, being in my role and now the role that I occupy uh, now as the Chief Conservation Officer at a time where an Audubon is 
um, undergoing a strategic planning effort um, has really been um, uh, really been overwhelming at times. Um, it's been um, uh, filled me with uh, optimism, filled me with nights that I can't sleep uh, as we're thinking about how to um, answer and address some of the most pressing questions and concerns affecting our birds. Um, and it certainly takes me across the hemisphere. Um, in my work, I must tell you that I log quite a few hours. I think I traveled this year 70% of the time uh, and hit five different countries um, and countless states. Um, and I spent a lot of time in the air and in airports and in the casual meet and greets when you are separated by nothing more than a armrest, you know, the conversation often goes to one's uh, avocation, one's work, um, and I have to find creative ways to explain to folks that uh, may not be bird birders or bird conservationists what I do for a living. Um, I'm certainly not a banker or a lawyer, um, but the conversation tends to tends to go there, and I. I, uh, everyone's always excited to hear that you work on birds and you uh, work on behalf of birds because there, and I'll talk about this in a second, there are so many of our, our fellow travelers um, uh, in the world of, of and, and joy uh, of birds that are out there. Um, but I often say Audubon is the world's largest organization dedicated to the preservation of birds. In that vein, we have an obligation to our 1,200 staff spread across 17 state and regional office, offices, 10 countries, and 450 community chapters. I share this not as a boast, but I say this so that I hear it, that I remember it, and remember the obligation and the oath that we have to our mission. Uh, may each of us in this room, whether we're representing ourselves, an academic institution, an agency, state or federal, um, a nonprofit, um, or a community group, may we never forget that. Um, may we never forget that there's a certain oath and an obligation that we all carry um, to our birds and our bird population. Um, responsibility that we have to our birds and the countless millions that love them as well. Uh, for me, the Audubon Society, uh, and for me and the Audubon Society, that oath relates to the birds of the Americas, birds that have filled our lives and our skies with color and song. These are the same birds now that call out to us through their silence. We've all read the reports. Um, I should probably move my... <laughs> We've all read the uh, reports, um, the Three Billion Birds Report, uh, local breeding bird surveys, the State of the Birds Report, the plow print. Um, how many of you have read the plow print from WWF? I encourage it as recommended, not recommended, but required reading. It is sobering. It comes out every year from WWF. Um, it is sobering. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the plow print, and it's really all about how the plow, like the chainsaw in the Amazon, it makes its way sweeping across the prairies and taking with it uh, our uh, cherished grassland bird songs. It's, again, required reading. I, I would really encourage it. Um, but they all paint the same sobering picture of bird decline, um, yet I'm going to do something a little different. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, on what we all know. Who knows it better than the group in this room? All of you see it in your, at your bird feeder. You see it in your backyard. You see it on those breeding bird surveys. How many of you are owners of a breeding bird survey route? Good, good. You see it every day, um, the loss of our birds across um, our communities. Uh, but I want to share with you what gives me hope. I'm 37 years old. I have to have some hope. Um, I'm going to inherit, and folks that are younger than me, we're going to inherit the decisions that we make today, the actions that we take or we do not take. And so um, I have no recourse but to be 
hopeful, and I hope that you are inspired by some of the just two really big things that I, I want to go over uh, that give me reasons for hope. And I want to share some of, uh, at a high level, um, you know, they say a uh, plan without action is just a speech. And so, so I want to share with you Audubon's flight plan for how we endeavor to be a part of bending the bird curve. And when I say the bird curve, we all know, I think, what I am referring to. Um, and that is the populations of our birds over the last uh, 50 plus years. Um, it is a path of loss um, that we probably haven't seen since the uh, uh, lead up to the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, in 1918. Um, but there are things that give me hope. Uh, number one, we are living in what I would describe as the renaissance period for bird, conserva bird conservation, migratory bird conservation science and its intersection with technology. Um, whether it is acoustics and what we can do through the Merlin app, what we can do through all of these various apps that help us identify birds and help us understand birds and their habitat. Um, more fundamentally, uh, we are, as ornithologists and bird conservationists, we are able to answer questions that have vexed us for a hundred plus years. Um, we are able to, our, we've always known that our birds leave our backyards and they winter somewhere or they, they breed somewhere. We're able to answer and track those birds to what is stressing them across many thousands of kilometers in ways that are uh, our uh, uh, generations before us would have uh, done anything to know those answers that empower the actions that can restore bird populations. Uh, oftentimes, it's not the, the um, willingness or lack thereof to take action, it's knowing what actions to take. And I think that is one of the um, incredible advantages that we have at this moment is that this is a true renaissance period for migratory bird science and the integration of technology uh, in helping us be more efficient in our work. Um, at Audubon, five years ago, we launched the Migratory Bird Initiative with many different partners and it's helping inspire our strategic efforts and the efforts of our partners as we are trying to figure out the stressors for birds like the black pole warbler and that incredible uh, uh, migratory uh, life cycle that this little bird that weighs, you know, as much as three sheets of paper makes. There are stressors along the way that we haven't always known and we are answering those questions, not just Audubon, but the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology and uh, the Smithsonian and the Fish and Wildlife Service, it truly is a remarkable time for answering the most important questions that are vital to bringing back our birds. And then, I have to say, and you are a part of this, and um, uh, I, it, 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 it's, it's really, I think, the most uh, important reason to have hope. What's that number mean? Somebody shout it out. Bird watchers. Uh, the uh, Department of Interior for years has tracked the number of hunters and recreationalists. Um, this number five years ago, pre-COVID, was 47 million, which is in and of itself a incredibly powerful number. But there are 96 million people who actively watch birds. Now, they may not have your uh, count, 50 county and seven country uh, bird li life list, right? Uh, but they love birds, they are animated by birds, and they are as yet, most of them, untapped for the actions that we need every day uh, to change that bird curve, to bend that bird curve. Um, each of us has an incredible superpower. And that is the choice that we have, the choices that we make in terms of food, the choices that we make politically. There are not 
four, 96 million registered Republicans in this country. There are not 96 million registered Democrats in this country. Think about what we are able to do if we are able to mobilize 96 million people who love birds to take the actions in their everyday life that support the recovery of bird populations. It truly is a superpower. And these folks will come from all walks of life. They have to. Um, the United States is becoming every day more diverse. Our bird conservation tent must be bigger. It helps us animate and mobilize more people um, to this cause, and that is needed more, more than ever. Um, so connecting with, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about um, how we can engage with uh, younger people, engage with people who engage with their hobby or their passion just through technology. We used to sort of poo-poo that. Um, it is the way of the world. And it is, I think, an incredible opportunity to reach people of all ages. But this is incredibly powerful, and I would not uh, for a second uh, lose sight of how important um, of a foundation that is. I think about there's one great story. Uh, there are many great stories, but in terms of uh, uh, conservation across a guild, across a suite of species, there's one great story right now in bird conservation, what is it? Waterfowl. Waterfowl. Um, you see all of our shorebirds, 37% loss, um, as Dale mentioned earlier, uh, since 1970. Our grassland birds, which I'll talk about, but waterfowl have stabilized and slightly recovered, and in some cases, recovered dramatically. Um, and it was the decisions that our waterfowl community from the one week a year volunteer to the Fish and Wildlife Service and all the organizations in between, they got focused on, and, and there was a long wet cycle in the West, but that's not what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk, they got focused on the most important actions and the sacrifices that they would need to make um, in the mid 1980s to recover uh, waterfowl populations. And we have. Um, and I think that is a reason for optimism. Now, I'm not here to tell you that um, preserving uh, black pole warblers and uh, lesser ye yellow legs are as straightforward as mallard ducks. They're not, um, uh, certainly not. But there are lessons to be learned from the last 30 years in waterfowl conservation that I think are really important as we think about and commit to bending the bird curve. Um, years from now, 50, 100 years from now, people are gonna ask, what did the bird conservation community do when the gauntlet was laid down at our feet? Uh, when we could no longer, when the notion of bird loss was not just anecdotal in your local Christmas bird count, but there was reputable empirical data that our birds are in crisis. What did we do? Um, I think about that and I challenge uh, my team at Audubon. What are they gonna say about at least our commitment to bending the bird curve? I think it's something, and I know it's something that you ask yourself. Um, for folks that have really experienced this, um, I remember uh, when this became, I, I studied business, not biology. And, and so what I know about birds and bird conservation, I learned out in the field. I learned with the local uh, CBC uh, coordinator and, and, and the local gr back, great backyard <coughs> bird count organizer, um, which has been tremendous. And one of my friends, um, uh, someone I've looked up to my entire career, Dave Lambeth out in the uh, Northwest. Dave uh, is a long time holder of a breeding bird survey route in the, in the Northwest, Northeast, North Dakota, Northwest. He probably does five or six routes a year. And I remember 13 years ago him telling me, Marshall, I've taken this route literally since 1981 when I moved to Grand Forks. And I would typically get between 150 and 200 calling meadowlarks. They're all gone. 
my routes are all silent. Not five now or, or maybe 20. None. So it's, it's, we can't ignore it anymore. And I know the people in this room don't ignore it. Um, I think we have to, I would encourage us all to think about how we can step out of our comfort zone. Um, if you're on Facebook or, or you're on uh, uh, different social media, you have to remember when it comes to birds, when it comes to the environment, uh, oftentimes you are the most credible person your friends know. Right, you are the whether they think of you as the bird geek or the bird nerd, or or when they have a bird that hits their window, they always come to you, right? Because you are because of your passion, the knowledge that you have accumulated over the years, be it whether you've been a bird uh, a conservationist for a year or fifty, you are the most credible person on the environment that your friends and family know big responsibility, right? Sometimes I forget that. Sometimes we, we all um, uh, forget that, uh, how people look up to us and the power that we have not only in our individual lives, but in, in helping and inspiring um, our friends and our family members to think about the food purchases they make, think about the um, policies they support and those policies and their impact uh, on birds. Um, my mentor, one of my, I've, I've had really so many people in my life that have shaped my life, um, reined in my many excesses, um, and supported uh, my, my career. Uh, Dr. John Challey, uh, who um, uh, passed away here a number of uh, years ago, was, was really one of my, my, really my great mentor. Uh, and Dr. Challey was a, a member of our, our board at Audubon, Dakota. And John would always tell me, uh, and he would compare the Amundsen and Scott explorations to the South Pole, and one being, you know, supremely focused, and the other being a little bit more of a social event. Well, one of those groups died on the ice, and one made it to the South Pole and back. And he would say, Marshall, focus is the main component of genius. We have to be focused. And I think this is one of the most important things in the bird conservation community and for organizations like Audubon, which, you know, we can be an inch deep and a mile wide. I'm not ashamed to say it, it it's true. Uh, we can waver on our focus and maybe our commitment to the fundamental essence of bird conservation. Um, and so in my role, um, I think it is a resp has been a responsibility to really take the organization um, and our partnerships back to a focus. And I want to talk really quickly about um, our flight plan, our strategic plan. Um, and I don't see this. I often scrub the timeline there. This is really a 20-year endeavor for, uh, for Audubon, for all of our, our communities. Um, thing, uh, big systemic changes. Um, and recovery efforts don't happen overnight. They don't happen in one year, or three years, or five years. Um, but this is our, how we're beginning our work, and, and I, there are really three main drivers that sum up the identity uh, for Audubon as we launch our flight plan, and that's being truly a hemispheric organization. Um, we just had our Audubon Leadership Conference in Estes Park, and we had 400 or so people there. And we had made a commitment. There were about 3 or 4 percent of our uh, attendees five years ago when we did the, the conference, or four years ago pre-COVID, that were under the age of 35, outside of the United States, um, or a member of a campus Audubon chapter. This year, it was over 32 percent. You know, it, it's, it's, we can't just talk about being more diverse, bringing more people in, being truly international, going where our birds go. We've had to make commitments to ensure that, that, um, that our room, at least the tables that we work at, that we, we scheme at, that we plan at, um, are as diverse as the communities that we will depend on for the preservation of our birds. Um, climate change. You know, this has always been uh, working in, in North Dakota. Um, it's not something that I actually can talk about in my work much. Um, but it's also helped 
Um, it's the greatest existential threat to birds in the planet. Um, but it is amorphous, right? It can feel political. It can feel like a distraction. It's hard to have a conversation about it. And so, but, but we know that Audubon and bird clubs and bird groups, there are places where if we weren't at the table, people would wonder. And there are places that we probably don't need to, to necessarily be at the table. I'm not gonna be involved in anything related to nuclear energy over the next five years. And no one's gonna miss me at those tables, right? But renewable energy, and I'll talk about it, renewable energy siting, um, renewable energy, and, and I'm gonna say, I, I usually give a, a bit of a disclaimer that uh, I often say things that are a little bit <laughs> uh, controversial, so, uh, but uh, you know, my, my uh, uh, dry cleaner knows how to get tomatoes out of my jacket, so throw away, that's just fine. Um, but uh, we have to be focused on um, the most important efforts around climate change. I would say from a bird conservation perspective, those efforts that both benefit um, and help address climate change, but equally as important, those efforts that could have an impact on bird habitat. I'll talk about that in a minute. And again, I, I, I can't stress this enough, um, we have to build and forge and facilitate a bird conservation community that looks like America. Not merely, and I wanna say something, not merely because it's politically expedient, not merely, because that means it's just about us. Um, I say it because I, th I think, I know, that there's a supreme amount of untapped intelligence, talent, innovation in our co indigenous, black, brown communities that are, isn't in the bird conservation community right now. Why would we leave that talent, those ideas, on the sideline? It's gonna require us uh, to step outside of our, our comfort zone uh, in ways that, that, that feel uncomfortable. Um, but sometimes, and I, I think a lot of times, that's where some of our greatest uh, growth happens. Underlying all of these three drivers has to be science. Um, I, I think science, regardless of our organizations, investing in science. Um, we, uh, over the last three years, have increased our science staff and, and investment, uh, I think double or triple uh, from the previous uh, three or four years. Um, it's, I think when I joined Audubon, we had a lot of scientists across the organization, uh, but in terms of our sort of central science team, I think we had four or five people. Um, and I think that team's now 32 or, or something like that, and we've embedded um, investments throughout the organization. It gives us credibility, it gives us efficiency in our work, um, and in some of these really um, uh, tenuous uh, political policy conversations, uh, being able to fall back on excellent, clear science and communicating science is really paramount, particularly as it relates to bringing new folks into the fold. Maybe p folks that, for whatever political reason, are a little bit apprehensive about uh, becoming a, a bird conservationist. Um, and you can see since 2015, um, our annual citations, our science work, there are many markers of scientific output. Uh, this is one I've chosen to, to use. It's something that, that's really important. Um, I think, I, I'm gonna say this about Audubon, but I, I would, if you're a chapter president or an organizational, on your, your organization's board or advisors, I, I'd encourage, one of the things that we did that was found fundamental to our strategic planning process was to think about who we are at our best. What are the attributes that uh, are most important when we have success? Um, it starts with science again, always starts with science. I, uh, I told our uh, chief scientist when I took this role two and a half years ago, well, I waited till I was interim and then our CEO made me permanent and then, and then I said all the things that I, <laughs> I had not been saying and one of them was to our, our chief scientist. I said, buckle up because Audubon's work is gonna be led by Audubon's science. Um, I need you to tell me everything you need 
and I'm going to uh, uh, come, you know, heck or high water, I'm going to uh, find it for you because it's really important. Um, embracing nonpartisanship. You know, the world is divided, the nation is divided, birds don't have to be, and our joy for birds don't have to be. I don't have to agree with um, everything a politician does that I work with. As long as if I am there for birds, and we can get to yes on something that's really important for birds, that's really what it's all about. And that is courage too. Sometimes we define courage just in sort of rebellious terms, and the things that are most rebellious uh, are the things that, that get identified as courage. Sometimes courage is working to a specific end with someone you might not vote for or have dinner with. Um, for us to really advance the solutions that we need to for birds, we're going to have to embrace uh, a nonpartisanship. And again, this work isn't just about yelling and screaming. It's getting into those back rooms where we can write policies that, that benefit birds. One of the things I'm most proud of uh, having been a part of, um, our Great Lakes team uh, work closely with Senator Braun, a Republican senator from Indiana, likely to be the next Republican governor from Indiana to um, bring on Republican co-sponsors for the Growing Climate Solutions Act. There's no way we pass it without those co-sponsors uh, and Senator Braun, who's a birder, go figure, right, um, uh, was instrumental in that. Uh, and again, we inspire an expansive flock and that flock has to get much bigger. Um, so, and of course, and always we have birds. And I, I get this a lot from my colleagues at the Nature Conservancy and others, they say, boy, I wish I, we had birds. I wish there was this, this easy way, you know, biodiversity is so complicated to measure. Um, other things, water quality, it's so complicated to measure. But birds are not just, it's not just some uh, cocktail party joke about the canary in the coal, coal mine. Um, it's been proven time and time again that birds are an early indicator of, of something wrong in the environment. And oftentimes, birds are the first clue that something has turned around for the better in the, in the environment. They, are, they do have that power, and they have that power to bring people that may, again, disagree on many things together. Um, I'm going to just go really quickly through, again, focus, main component of genius. And we've tried to be focused in identifying five years ago, five years from now, what's different? What have we done? that is sort of represents a down payment on this uh, effort to bring back our birds. We, it, through our uh, process, we identified 1.2 billion acres across the hemisphere that represents the most important uh, landscapes for conservation, protection, restoration um, uh, for birds. And so over the next five years, we're focused on a down payment, if you will. And this is not just Audubon. It can't be just Audubon. We are a small, fork in, in, uh, uh, in, in the, the uh, uh, wheel um, in all of this, but um, it's important for Audubon, given how uh, large and, and, and uh, influential we can be, to have some focus around uh, where we're going. Climate, I mentioned it earlier. Our focus is going to be on renewable energy siting. Um, there's a million things we could focus on. But renewable energy siting is so important for us to focus on because if we do it and get it wrong, it could be disastrous for birds. But we must do it. Um, and so Audubon is committed to um, siting 100 uh, gigawatts of new renewable energy uh, transmission and generation over the next five years. When we take care of our natural ecosystems, we often take care of climate as well in terms of empowering natural ecosystems to do what they do, whether it's wetlands or grasslands, sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. And, and so we've, we've committed over the last five years, we, um, uh, through all of our work, we calculated about 14 billion metric tons were sequestered through our work. Um, so we have to double that in the same uh, period of time. Uh, so uh, no one ever said it's going to be easy. Um, 
and we, we want to get focused on policy and, and community building as well. Um, the big takeaway here is we have two million people sort of in our stakeholder network. We want to double that over the next five years. We have to double that over the next five years for us to have the impact across this ecosystem. I mentioned those 1.2 billion acres, um, and I could go really granular on this and make my chief scientist proud and get real nerdy. I'm not going to uh, today, uh, but um, that, those it's an expansive landscape that we have to work and um, lead and follow um, across the hemisphere. Um, and when it comes to bending the bird curve, the one suite of species that represent probably our most difficult task, species that you've been uh, hearing about, uh, talking about uh, today, species that um, are, you know, my spark bird is the prairie chicken, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and this landscape is the most imperiled. I want to bring that to life visually. And you know where Bismarck is, you see where you are. That's the um, prairie pothole region um, 100 years ago. And I want you to watch the prairie pothole region over the next 100 years. In Minnesota, we've lost about 98% of our grassland ecosystem. 20 million acres once covered, 20 million acres of grasslands once covered, I believe it's less than half a million today. Um, uh, and the same is true across what I call the central uh, grasslands uh, ecosystem. I don't call it that. The central grasslands roadmap is a thing, right? It's not just me. Um, and this, we have roughly th 377 million acres that remain of native or uh, CRP, what have you, across that landscape, across those three countries. I'm um, in the same, I was in the uh, Juanos region of Colombia. Um, if you go to the southern cone grasslands or to southern Saskatchewan, as you can see here, the drivers are in many cases the same, corn, beans, wheat, ethanol. Um, the, the drivers are, whether it's Nebraska or um, uh, Uruguay, the drivers are, are the same, uh, uh, <laughs> strangely enough. Um, and this was an ecosystem that was once spread out, just in this footprint alone, uh, roughly one billion acres. So we've lost about 70% across the ecosystem, right, across the footprint. I said I wasn't going to be negative earlier, but now <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit real with you about um, what you know to be true, right? Um, uh, you think about this in the context of the Amazon, uh, Amazonian rainforest. You know how much of that ecosystem we've lost? 16%, right? Everyone thinks about the Amazon, as we should, the lungs of the world. But we seldom shed a tear, and I'm not talking about the folks in this room, but generally, we seldom shed a tear for what we've done to uh, North America's uh, largest terrestrial ecosystem, native e ecosystem over the last 100 years. And we've accelerated these uh, uh, conversion rates, conversion, uh, converting grasslands uh, to farmland we've, and, and urban sprawl. We've ag aggressively um, uh, and rapidly uh, uh, f quickened this pace since the passage of the uh, renewable fuel standard in 2006, which ushered in a um, era of ethanol. Um, and if you drove a car here today, uh, and it's not an EV, um, odds are we all are part of the problem. Uh, we see our um, uh, airlines uh, very proud of the renewable aviation fuel. A lot of it's based on ethanol, um, which is really driving. Uh, over the, since 2012, we lost 37 million acres of native prairie across this footprint. Um, and again, in the Amazon, we call it 20%. At 20%, the Amazon rainforest begins to tip. 
Um, we don't know exactly what that is for grasslands because modern sort of Western science, uh, most of this ecosystem, we passed 50% 50, 50 years ago, right? So um, we're probably in some sense, we don't know all of what we've lost in this ecosystem because so few, uh, so little data really uh, besides observational data and also traditional eco uh, indigenous knowledge, um, it's only helps sort of piece together a, a picture of what we've lost in this ecosystem. Um, and what are the drivers? Food and energy culture, number one. Really, what we eat, what we choose to eat, um, how we choose to power ourselves, food and energy culture is really at the heart. Um, the choices that we make the policies we allow to be initiated on our behalf, we are co-signers. There's no difference between the chainsaw and the plow. We are co-signers on what happens. It's not land use decisions. Oftentimes we demonize farmers and I, and I, I really try to reject and, and, and uh, stay away from that because I, I think uh, we choose our food policy. We choose it every five years, really, with Farm Bill, and I'll talk about that uh, in a second. Um, but food and energy policy, our food uh, and energy culture, and a general lack of, of, of awareness. So few people, I took this picture yesterday when I was flying from uh, Chicago. How many of you have seen that picture out of your uh, airplane window? All of you have. Just think about the vastness, and certainly and surely we need cropland. We had, it's a basis of our society, right? Um, but we've also made decisions. We waste 35% of our food. If we could curtail waste, we could curtail the need for more land to produce our, the same amount of food that we need, right? But these are choices that we make. These are, are decisions that we make, decisions that I make that I am uh, uh, constantly wanting to be and do better. From my uh, perspective, when it comes to the grasslands ecosystem, there are three main things that we need to do. Um, number one, and you heard Dale uh, talk about our conservation ranching program, and it's one of an, a lot of efforts ar around this. It's the largest, not to brag. It's Minnesota, we're Lutheran, we're in the Norwegian, we don't brag here, okay? Uh, but uh, it is the largest regenerative uh, uh, grazing program in the country. Um, and it's really inspired me and inspired our organization um, to see it work. Um, it's certainly not where we, uh, are the, are the true vision of the Bird Friendly Beef uh, program, but again, no cows, no grass, no birds. And so uh, we've taken, I can tell you, it was an uphill climb. I was there, and Mark was there, uh, to, to say that we were going to put our name on packages of beef um, was pretty outrageous to a lot of people. It was sort of anathema, as you can imagine. But again, it comes back to the science. Cows are just an ungulate, just like bison just like giraffes, just like zebras, right? And, and whether it's the Serengeti or the tall grass prairie um, here in the United States, the uh, large ruminant uh, is a part of that ecosystem. And we, if, if we have cows, there are ways to manage them better. And we uh, are committed to our market-based program, but we've got to scale market-based co conservation. We've got to find ways to empower and make sure people are aware. Most birders, every survey I see, and I'm sure if I did a hand check here, but I don't want to embarrass myself if I'm wrong. Um, most uh, birders um, have some type of beef a part of their diet. Uh, on average, about only 20, 15 to 20% are vegan or vegetarian. That's a great opportunity to be more thoughtful about whether it's beef or hummus, how it's produced and using that choice as a power. I spoke about it earlier, there's many ways I can go down a rabbit hole about how we can, can and should empower the 96 million people that love birds, um, but I'll let your mind run wild. Um, we've talked about energy and food policy. I wanna drill down a little bit here. Um, uh, and just again, I mentioned the renewable fuel standard. Um, again, amending that 
we don't have to do away with eth ethanol, but amending the renewable fuel standard so that acres that produce ethanol are not on recently converted grasslands would go a long way. It just would be smart policy. Most of the acres that are left are low producing farmland anyway. Uh, highly erodible uh, soils that blow away in the wind when we over farm uh, through conventional tillage uh, these acres. So that's one way through this farm, through this farm bill and and uh, uh, in Washington that we can address uh, the issue. Sod saver is a provision uh, within uh, uh, the farm bill and overall uh, crop su subsidies that helps uh, to, and it's been in different places, but really what we, what we need to do is ensure that uh, newly converted uh, grasslands cannot be insured. Uh, we don't need to plow up, it's not, sound science, it's not sound ag policy, to plow up highly erodible land uh, for corn and beans. Um, and we've got a lot of new funding through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, for climate smart agriculture. We need to protect that funding and get more funding uh, into the system. So there are things, you will be inundated with a lot of politics <laughs> over the next year, but the, if, if uh, embedded or, or shrouded in all of the political attack ads that uh, uh, you will see over the next year is really important, fundamentally um, vital uh, policy on farm bill. Farm, the farm bill shapes agriculture in this country and you and your neighbors shape the farm bill. Make no doubt about it. Um, and again, when I think about, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, um, when I think about uh, grasslands and how I've sort of come to think about grasslands conservation, you notice that I did not mention land protection. Um, I could go down a rabbit hole with you about this, but um, I fundamentally believe that we need to encourage and empower farmers and ranchers, particularly ranchers, to adopt regenerative agriculture methodologies that are better for the soil, better for the habitat, um, and spend our time there. Uh, certainly I will never turn my nose up at a, you know, a new protected area, but when you look at that whole ecosystem, and as much as we've lost, there's still a lot left, and our ranchers are gonna need to be our biggest advocates. Uh, then about 80% of what's left is either owned or managed by people like Todd and Cindy Brown. Uh, this is Todd and Cindy Brown. I completed my first habitat project with them uh, oh, about 13 years ago now. Um, and uh, we were opening up a uh, grass-based sanctuary that hadn't been burned or grazed for God knows how long, uh, which is terrible uh, ecologically, uh, to his operation. And he was going to implement new practices on his land. He's, we're going to let him graze our land. He was going to improve his land. And I'll, I'll never forget, he's five hours away, so all the way on the other side of North Dakota, away from Fargo, I would never forget we met uh, and completed the project. And he said something to me as I was leaving. He said, Marshall, this is just great. This is just wonderful uh, that we were able to get this project done. Um, you don't care about my cows or what happens to them, and I can't keep up with all the LBBs out here, you know, little brown birds. But he said, we made this work. And I don't know why, but on the five hours home and ever since, his words haunt me. I better be interested in what happens to his cows. I better be focused on making sure that he's profitable, ma profitable, making sure that I'm supporting not just his land management, but his operation so he and his family can be there. Because when he's gone, the plow will follow. We have to remember that. And we have to remember, uh, as we think about our neighbors and our family members and the people that we can reach, um, and we think about grasslands, I will just leave you with the profound words of the Lorax. Thank you. I think I ended up talking much longer than I wanted to, but you guys were encouraging me. We're all good.
questions out there for Marshall? I'm going to let Clint do it because I can't see without my glasses. Can you tell us what uh, Audubon's going to do about neonics? I know some states have banned it completely, but we don't have that as a universal uh, uh, law. Yeah. And, uh, did everyone hear neonicotinoids are pesticides, um, and they are uh, bred into the plants themselves. So they, in one way, uh, they avoid overspraying, but they are uh, the links between neonicotinoids and not just bees, but yes, bees, but the entire insect web of which birds depend on um, is becoming stronger every day. Um, and it's a huge issue that we, we have to address. Uh, Audubon goes about it um, through our conservation ranching program. We don't allow neonicotinoids uh, uh, as a part of the certification. Um, and uh, we also, it's not just neonicotinoids, there are pores and other things that conventional operations use that we, a part of the conservation ranching program that Dale mentioned earlier, um, uh, helps to wean, <laughs> pun, wean uh, the operation off of those chemicals and finding natural um, alternatives that are not as harmful or harmful at all to the insect population. But in a, in a bigger sense, um, I think, again, when we think about Farm Bill and we think about the food system that we want, we have to get serious about neonicotinoids. We focus on habitat, and there's a good reason for it. Um, but I've seen a number of studies. You can look up my colleague, uh, Dr. Nicole Michael, um, with Audubon, she's completed a number of compelling studies, or been a part of a number of compelling studies that you know, nic neonicotinoids and pesticides might actually be um, as big or bigger issue for grassland birds than anything, um, which, is, which is scary because of how prevalent um, pesticides and neonicotinoids are in our current conventional food model. Thank you, it's a great question. Thank you. Say we've talked a lot today about focusing on habitat, and we've seen amazing restoration projects. I'm wondering who can guide uh, the urban suburban center policymakers on assuring their planners set aside space for habitat and where we live. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, a part of our our habitat work, and in, it's an area that. We think, and I would encourage others as well, urban conservation, I think, is, is really a huge opportunity. One of the reasons, particularly for grasslands, but more generally, 50 years ago, most of us lived in cities smaller than Omaha. Now, most of us live in cities, uh, uh, you know, Minneapolis are bigger, right? And so our proximity to nature, our connectivity to na nature, um, is not as easy as it was for our parents and grandparents because most people were agrarians. Most people lived either in uh, rural, uh, nature uh, sort of adorned places or, or close to it. Um, and so I think systematically uh, we need to uh, forge policies that can be adopted by developers that center natural infrastructure for a myriad of reasons that I'm sure most folks in here are um, uh, aware of, but but one of the uh, you know partners in flight put out a a, a study on the most um, uh, biggest uh, threats to migratory birds, and actually I believe number two was urban sprawl. So creating habitat in urban landscapes are just absolutely vital. Specifically to your question, question there are certainly things you can do at the federal level. But that's truly a city council level um, opportunity for local chapters, bird clubs, you know, identifying, you know, who your city council is, what are the local building ordinance, uh, you know, they can really affect change. And if you can partner with developers to uh, support that type of, of local policymaking and ordinances, uh, it can really be um, special. Otherwise, we're just clawing back. I've been a part of a number of urban conservation uh, programs and they're great. Um, it's it's great to have success there. Um, but as we we're gonna continue to grow, 
you know, the population is going to continue to get bigger. And if we can do that in less impactful uh, ways, um, I think all the better uh, for sure. And it happens really at your city council and local level. That's, that's where you can have a big impact by meeting three, or five, three to five people that are on your city council and, and really developing a strategy um, for influencing better ordinances and policies. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, this is a little, maybe a little off topic, but related to your points about equity and inclusion. Has the National Audubon Society discussed, reached any conclusion about the AOS's recent decision to change or get rid of individual bird names, uh, individuals named on birds? Is that a topic that you guys have been? Uh, <laughs> It's certainly, I appreciate the question, it's certainly a, a huge topic um, for Audubon as a partner to uh, AOS, but also um, because we've gone through this very difficult process in evaluating um, uh, our name as the Audubon Society. I think most people in here think about Audubon, they think about birds and, and art, um, but uh, John James Audubon, ahead of had a very ugly history um, uh, uh, as well, right? And so um, in terms of your specific question, whatever uh, AOS would have decided, we would have supported. And they've made a decision and a, a determination, and I think they've gone through a very thoughtful process, and we support and will adopt the decision that they've made. Um, and that will require a lot of changes. We have. Uh, Audubon app, we have Audubon books, we have with all of these current names, this is gonna require a heavy lift for um, our organization, but again, from the outset, we recognize their authority, um, their re responsibility, and the thoughtful process that they would um, uh, uh, undergo, and we support ultimately their, des their decision. Uh, yeah, oh, I just um, wanted to, emphasize one of the points in your talk, and that was about um, farm policy. I mean, a lot of our land conversion occurred before the 60s, when, which is when we began monitoring birds, yeah. and um, yet birds have continued to decline. And I think if the audience doesn't know that, the single most important thing in Minnesota has been farm policy. That's right. And up in the Northwest, you saw marginal lands being converted incredibly fast in the late 90s and early 2000s because corn prices were high and it made it economically feasible to do that. And then second of all, CRP. And um, the fact that the United States has lowered the cap on CRP was already, was had a visible impact because okay. we lost hundreds of thousands of acres in Minnesota. And the decline we saw earlier, the bobolink that people were asking about, it corresponds with the loss of those CRP acres. So farm policy is just, in Minnesota, has got to be one of the biggest important factors for grassland birds. Thank you. And I would just add, um, and I really appreciate uh, and would underscore, because you were underscoring my points, and so it's just sort of a mutual admiration society here. Um, I would underscore, um, are, are there any farmers in the room? There are, um, and you may know farmers. Um, sometimes in engaging with farmers and talking about issues like this, you feel like you don't want to go there, right? And you don't want to talk about it. Um, you would be surprised. Um, the conventional system that we have today, in part, is built on and uh, encourages and almost demands um, a mountain of debt for our farmers. Um, the conventional system, the reality is, um, our farmers have a higher suicide rate than combat veterans. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that is broken. <laughs> now again, we've asked our farm system to do something, and it has succeeded uh, exceedingly well. We asked for yields and pro production. Um, and we are smart enough, we are capable enough, and farmers, of, well, I've talked to farmers and ranchers across uh, this uh, country and internationally. Um, 
they sense something's broken. They want to change. But the system and the, the policy that undergirds their operation, the, the policies and the approach that their banker um, will only, only fund them for um, tells them to do a certain way. Um, but they are innovative enough, willing uh, to make those changes um, that are healthier for the land and healthier for uh, habitat. And it really comes down to farm bill and, and farm policy and food policy. This is not a real political issue. Um, it's in our best interest. And don't be surprised when if you say that to a farmer you know or and they're your biggest advocate. Um, that's been my experience that folks want to do things a different way um, because it, it's not really working for them more than you know. Yeah, um, quick question. Do you know about the, um, oh God, the uh, Pesticide Action Network PAN and does Audubon ever work with them? I'm not sure. Oh, um, well, I think it would be a great organization um, because they, they oppose the, uh, the uh, pesticides and herbicides, and they do a lot of grass works, grassroots work with that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. I'm new to Audubon and to this organization, so I don't know if this already exists. Do you have something like action alerts where a lot of organizations that I support send out letters that say, hey, sign this and this goes to your legislatures, et cetera? Does that yes. exist? Go yes. ahead. I will, would like to get signed. I will get signed up and I'll send the emails. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, partially not true. Thanks everybody for your questions and thank you Marshall. Thank you.